Hi, welcome to Creation Care Church, Friday Night Live message. And today's topic is the forbidden fruit. So this is one of those passages, Genesis 2, verse 17. And it is one of the most enigmatic passages, one of the most talked about mysteries in all of scripture. So this is also some, a question that has perplexed people for a long time. And there's many different opinions on what the forbidden fruit is. So what we would like to do today is to piece together some various clues that the Bible gives us as to what this forbidden fruit is. And this isn't a talk that's intended to be the once for all answer, and it doesn't necessarily reflect all of Creation Care Church's views. This is sort of the, the result of my own personal research and we decided it would be a good idea to make this into a live talk to share with you what my own personal view is on what the forbidden fruit is. And so I hope that for many of you, this will be um, a talk that will be really important to you in helping to figure out what this mystery is. And for others of you, it will at least be interesting and give you something to think about. So again, today's talk isn't uh, a fundamental belief of Creation Care Church. This is just uh, the result of my own personal research that I'm sharing with you today. So I hope that you find tonight's talk interesting. So a few announcements before we start is that the we have a prayer meeting on this Sunday. So this is this Sunday at 11 o'clock Pacific, 1 o'clock Central, 2 o'clock Eastern and seven o'clock PM in the UK. So whatever that translates to in your time zone, if you'd like to join us, go to CCC or Creation Care Church per, uh, Purs and Prayers group, or the Purs and Prayers Facebook page. And there there's information about how to join. You could also email prayer at creationcarechurch.org if you would like us to pray for you uh, in that meeting. Um, so that's the email, and that's how you can get in contact. And then secondly, as usual, we have the fellowship afterwards uh, on Zoom. So if you'd like to join us for that, there's a pinned comment. If you're joining us through Facebook, if you're joining us through YouTube, I haven't figured out yet how to make a pinned comment on YouTube. But if you look up Creation Care Church link tree, uh, it should be the first thing that comes up if you search for that, just on like a typical Google search or whatever. And then there's a link to the fellowship. It's the same link every week. So if you'd like to join us, meet some like-minded people, that happens immediately following the live talk tonight. Also, uh, the Facebook lives are now run as events. So we don't have a promo image anymore. We now have an event. So if you'd like to invite somebody to the event, uh, just share the event uh, for the talk. So today's talk, The Forbidden Fruit, you would just share the event. And if you're joining us from YouTube, whether you're joining us live or late, the videos are now in the live tab. So they used to be in the video tab when we would manually, manually upload them, but now these talks are now under the live tab. So hopefully it's pretty easy to find them. Just wanted to let you know that that's where they're at. All right, so now let's open with a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, thank you so much for all the people that you've brought here today and all the people who will listen to this talk afterwards. We just pray for your guidance as we go through this uh, very fascinating topic. And we just pray that uh, you would give us guidance as we endeavor to learn what this forbidden fruit is. We pray this all in your son Jesus' name, Yeshua HaMashiach, Emmanuel, God with us. Amen. So I made tonight's talk into a live, a slideshow in order to make it easier to follow. And if you have any questions or comments, be sure to ask that in the chat and we'll get to that in the second part of the talk. So the first scripture we should look at is Genesis chapter two, verse nine. It says, and out of the ground, the Lord God made every tree grow that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. 
The tree of life was in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So those are the two trees that we're going to be looking at today. So two, there we go, kind of off camera. There we go. The two trees that we're looking at today, the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So now let's go down to verses 15 to 17. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. So there's these, this tree of life, which I guess we can eat from. It's among all the other trees. But then there's also this tree of knowledge of good and evil. And he says, do not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. That's the one command. The one thing he says, don't eat. You can eat from any tree, eat from anything, just not the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So now let's go to chapter three of Genesis, where there's three different trees that are mentioned. So if we start with Genesis three, verse 22, it says, then the Lord God said, behold, the man has become like one of us to know good and evil. And now lest he put out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. So now in Genesis 3, it's mentioning again this tree of life. So that's the first tree that we want to keep in mind is this tree of life. And then in Genesis 3, verse 7, it says, Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. So this is after they ate from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. They sewed fig leaves together. So how would there be fig leaves unless there's a fig tree? So that's the second tree that is mentioned is the fig tree. So there's the tree of life and there's the fig tree. Now third, if we go down to verse 17, it says, Then to Adam he said, Because you have heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. And then verse 18 both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the herb of the field. So there's supposed to be, um, let's see. Okay, so those two passages, it mentions this tree, this tree of knowledge of good and evil, the one he said not to eat from, that's the third tree. And then this fourth one is this thorns and thistles. Like, what is that? What's thorns and thistles? Well, the word there in Hebrew is kotz, which is Hebrew in the Strong's uh, 6975, if you want to look it up for yourself. And that is usually translated as thorn bush. So there's four different kinds of trees that are mentioned. There's the tree of life, there's the fig tree, there's the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and there's the thorn bush. So four trees that are mentioned in Genesis chapter 3. So you have the two trees that we've mentioned in the beginning, the tree of life, tree of knowledge of good and evil, but now we have fig tree and thorn bush added. So now let's turn to another story in Judges where there's four trees mentioned. So let's go to Judges. So don't judge this talk until you've heard, heard it all the way through. Let's go to Judges chapter 9. And let's look at verses 7 to 15. But first, let's kind of start doing it piecemeal. Let's go 7 to 9. Now, when they told it to Jotham, he went and stood on top of Mount Gerizim and lifted his voice and cried out and said to them, Listen to me, you men of Shechem, that God may listen to you. The trees once went forth to anoint a king over them. And they said to the olive tree, reign over us. But the olive tree said to them, should I cease giving my oil with which they honor God and men and go to sway over trees? So here the first tree that's mentioned is the olive tree. And the olive tree gives forth oil for anointing. So that's the first tree that they went to to make the, their king. And now let's look at verses 10 and 11. 
Then the trees said to the fig tree, you come and reign over us. But the fig tree said to them, should I cease my sweetness and my good fruit and go to sway over trees? So now the second tree that's mentioned here is a fig tree. And it gives us sweetness. So remember the fig tree is like there's in the, let the promised land, there's those sweet figs and other fruits. Now let's look at verses 12 and 13. Then the trees said to the vine, you come and reign over us. But the vine said to them, should I cease my new wine, which cheers both God and men and go to sway over trees? So now this third is this vine, a grapevine, where they get new wine or this uh, grape juice from this grapevine. Now let's look at verses 14 and 15. Then all the trees said to the bramble, and this is that same word, coats, which is thorn bush. So they go to this thorn bush. You come and reign over us. And the bramble said to the trees, if in truth you anoint me as king over you, then come and take shelter in the shade. But if not, let fire come out of the bramble and devour the cedars of Lebanon. So here, interestingly, we have those four same trees those same uh, that are mentioned in Genesis chapter 3. And so is there a connection here? So if we look at them sort of side by side, you have the first tree in Genesis chapter 3, which is the, the tree of life. And then you have the fig tree. Then you have the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Then you have the thorn bush. And in Judges, we have the olive tree, the fig tree, the grapevine and the thorn bush. So presumably, if uh, if there really is a pattern here, which I don't see why there wouldn't be, the fig tree would match up to the fig tree, the thorn bush would match up to the thorn bush, and so now the question is, what does the tree of life match onto, and what does the tree of knowledge of good and evil match onto? Because we have an olive tree and a grapevine left. Well, let's continue. So if we go to Numbers, chapter 13. So Numbers, chapter 13. And let's read verses 23 to 27. Then they came to the valley of Eskel, and there cut down a branch with one cluster of grapes. They carried it between two of them on a pole. They also brought some of the pomegranates and figs. The place was called the valley of Eshkel because of the cluster which the men of Israel cut down there. And they returned from spying out the land after 40 days. So they departed and came to Moses and Aaron and all the congregation of the children of Israel in the wilderness of Paran at Kadesh. They brought back word to them and to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. So those fruit that they just mentioned. Then they told him and said, we went to the land where you sent us. It truly flows with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. So we did another live talk on what does it mean for a land to be flowing with milk and honey. And the evidence of this isn't they brought back cow's milk and bee honey. It's that they brought back fruit. So this is this uh, flowing with milk and honey. Uh, I think probably a, a better translation is fatness and sweetness. And so it's basically this abundance of fruit. And what I want to point out here for the purpose of tonight's talk is in verse 23, it says they brought back the cluster of grapes and two men had to carry it on a pole between them. So if we go to the grocery store and we purchase a cluster of grapes, it's usually like a pound or two of grapes that you can hold in your hand. It's very small. How large would, a, would, would one cluster of grapes have to be that requires not just one man to carry it himself, but two men to carry it on a pole between them? This is like moving furniture level of largeness. So when we think of a grape vine, people think, well, that's not really a tree. But if you think of grapes that cluster that large, think of how how thick that uh, that that stem, that vine would have to be. So it would look like a tree if it's that big. 
So I just wanted to kind of point that out. And now secondly, let's look at 1 Samuel 16, verse 1. So this is 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 1. Then the Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill your horn with oil, and go, I am sending you to Jesse, the Bethlehemite, for I have provided myself a king among his sons. So this is just to, to show, and this is something that happens throughout the Bible, is that anointing happens with oil. And so that's what the anointing is. It is to be anointed with oil. And so the olive tree is gives oil, and that oil is used for anointing, uh, at, along with other oils that are also used for that purpose. Uh, but there's another purpose for this olive oil. So if we go to 1 Kings chapter 17, and we look at verses 7 through 16, And this should be familiar to a lot of you uh, when it's that story of Elijah and the raven uh, from a few weeks ago. Uh, but I just wanted to kind of show you that in this story, there's the oil. The bread is made with oil. So it's oil and water, and it doesn't run out in this story. It's this miracle. Uh, but so there's these two primary purposes for olives or this olive tree. It is to produce oil for the anointing and oil for making bread. Those are the two ways in which it comes up the most in scripture. And now when we think of this bread and the wine together, those are often coupled together. So we think of the Last Supper. We also think of Melchizedek in Genesis 14, where it says that he brings out bread and wine. So we see this pairing constantly together. So it shouldn't be a surprise that there's some, some deeper significance to this pairing together. So now the next thing I want to look at, we, the, the three primary things that we've looked at so far, we looked at the four trees in Genesis chapter 3, and then we compared that with the four trees in Judges. And now this third thing that I want to show you is the Nazarite vow. So we're going to go back to the book of Numbers, and we're going to read from chapter 6. This is what's known as the Nazarite vow. So Numbers chapter 6, we're going to start with verses 1 through 4. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When either a man or a woman consecrates an offering to take the vow of a Nazarite, to separate himself to the Lord. He shall separate himself from wine and similar drink. He shall drink neither vinegar made from wine nor vinegar made from similar drink. Neither shall he drink any grape juice nor eat fresh grapes or raisins. All the days of his separation, he shall eat nothing that is produced by the grapevine from the seed to skin. So this first command, if you are taking this Nazarite vow to consecrate yourself or devote yourself or set yourself apart to the Lord, is you would not consume any grape products. You would not consume the flesh of grapes, uh, what's known as the blood of grapes, or which is the, the wine or the juice, and any vinegar which is made from this wine, or any raisins, which are like the shriveled up, sun-dried sort of grapes, uh, nothing that's made from the seed, the skin, or the juice. So consume no grape products whatsoever. Why is that? Well, maybe we'll find out in a second. But now the, the second thing in verse 5, all the days of the vow and his separation, no razor shall come upon his head until the days are fulfilled, for which he separated himself to the Lord. He shall be holy. Then he shall let the locks of the hair of his head grow. So if you've ever known someone who's taken a Nazarite vow, they have these really long beards, if they've been doing it for a while, and really long hair. And it's almost like a, it's sometimes referred to as like a, a camel mantle, mantle of camel hair kind of. 
And so he's got long flowing hair and long bushy beard because you're not cutting any of the hair of your beard or on your head. So that's sort of an outward sign that somebody is a Nazarite. Now let's read six through eight. All the days that he separates himself to the Lord, he shall not go near a dead body. He shall not make himself unclean even for his father or his mother, for his brother or his sister when they die, because his separation to God is on his head. All the days of his separation, he shall be holy to the Lord. So this third instruction is to not go near or touch any dead body. So you would not consume any grape product whatsoever, neither the flesh nor the blood of grapes nor any product thereof, nor shall you cut the hair on your head, nor shall you touch any dead body. So don't touch a corpse. So is this just some random hodgepodge of rules or is there some unifying purpose for this? All right, so now next, let's go back to that original chapter, Genesis chapter one. This is where we start tying things together. So Genesis chapter one, verses 26 to 31. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them, and God said, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth. Subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, See, I have given you every herb that yields seed, which is on the face of all the earth, and every tree whose fruit yields seed, to you it shall be for food. And to every beast of the earth, to every bird of the air, and to everything that creeps on the earth, in which there is life, I have given every green herb for food. And it was so. Then God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. So the evening and the morning were the sixth day. So God creates everything, and he creates humanity in his image and likeness, gives them dominion over everything, including the animals. But he says, eat any, any fruit of any tree that has seed, eat any vegetation of the ground. But what's the one thing that we would not be allowed to eat? We're not allowed to eat the other creatures. And so that's the one thing that we are not permitted to eat. We can eat of any tree. He doesn't say anything about any tree being forbidden here. Only the animals would be forbidden. But now let's go to Genesis 9 after the flood. So now in Genesis 9, if we look at verses 1 through 8, it's kind of this, this mixed blessing where he's blessing them and saying, be fruitful, multiply, similar to Genesis 1. But now there's like this, uh, this recognition of bloodshed um, and so the key verse here I want to point out is that in verse four, it says, but you shall not eat flesh with its life. That is its blood. So here again, the one thing that we're not permitted to eat is this flesh and blood. So interesting how the Nazarite vow, the one thing that you're not allowed to eat is the flesh and blood of grapes. And the other thing that you're not allowed to do is touch a dead body. Well, how would you eat an animal's dead body if you're not touching that animal's dead body? So presumably, you would not be allowed to eat animal bodies. So now the other thing that's said about this, this fruit that you're not supposed to eat, if you eat it, you will surely die. So if you go back to Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 3, it says, Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden. But the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it nor shall you touch it, lest you die. 
So interesting how she adds this extra instruction that we're not even supposed to touch it, kind of like the Nazarite vow, where we're not even supposed to touch a dead body. So we're not supposed to eat the flesh and blood of grapes or touch a dead body. And the one instruction that God gives us from the beginning, we can eat of any fruit of the tree of the garden that has seed and any of the plants of the ground, but he's, he's prohibiting us from eating animal flesh. And that's explicitly what, what he says in Genesis 9. He says, don't eat the flesh and the blood. Okay, it's another connection. And so if what I'm suggesting is that this these grapes are symbolic of the flesh and blood of creatures, that that's really what we're not supposed to be consuming when we take this vow to not eat the flesh and blood of grapes. Well, why would this cause us to die if what I'm saying is correct? So let's go to Galatians chapter 6, verse 7. So this is Galatians chapter 6, verse 7. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. Well, interesting. What was the cunning serpent trying to do? He was trying to deceive humanity. And what happens if we kill? Then we would be killed. So if we're killing an animal to eat their flesh and blood, then we would reap what we sow. That if we're killing, then we would be killed. And so he says, don't eat this fruit lest you die. Well, if that fruit is the flesh and blood of other creatures, then you're causing death, then you will reap that. That's part of his divine justice. And this doesn't just show up in the New Testament. We also see it in the Old Testament. So if you go to Hosea chapter 10, that is Hosea chapter 10, verses 12 through 13. Sow for yourselves righteousness. Reap in mercy. Break up your fallow ground for it is time to seek the Lord till he comes and rains righteousness on you. You have plowed wickedness. You have reaped iniquity. You have eaten the fruit of lies, the fruit of deception, because you trusted in your own way in the multitude of your mighty men. So interesting here that it's saying to sow for yourselves righteousness and you will reap mercy. So when Jesus says, learn what this means, I want mercy, not sacrifice. And he's quoting Hosea 6.6. 6. And he says in Luke, uh, I believe it's Luke 3.6, where he says, be merciful just as your father is merciful. So we want to be merciful toward animals. We don't want to uh, sow this unrighteousness, sow this wickedness by causing violence to them so we can eat their flesh and blood that would be eating from the fruit of lies, this fruit of deception. So we don't want to be deceived into doing that. So then what would be the tree of life, which would be the antithesis of this tree of knowledge of good and evil, this uh, fruit of deception that we aren't supposed to eat, that we've been prohibited from eating from the beginning. So let's look at Proverbs chapter 3. This is Proverbs chapter 3 verses 13 to 18. Happy is the man who finds wisdom and the man who gains understanding. For her proceeds are better than the profits of silver and her gain than fine gold. She is more precious than rubies and all the things you may desire cannot compare with her. So even if the fruit of the tree is desirable to make one wise, it's deceptive. That's not where wisdom is found. Length of days is in her right hand. In her left hand, riches and honor. Her ways are ways of pleasantness. And all her ways are ways of peace, which is typically uh, contrasted with violence. So none of her ways are ways of violence, but instead all her ways are peace. And then 18, she wisdom is a tree of life 
to those who take hold of her, and happy are all who retain her. So this wisdom of God would be the tree of life, and all her ways are ways of peace. But the tree that's the antithesis of this tree of life, that would be the tree whose ways are deceptive and whose ways are the opposite of peace, the ways of violence, the ways of bloodshed, the very thing that those taking the Nazarite vow are abstaining from. Not only do they not consume the flesh and the blood, but they don't even touch the dead body. So now, sort of to sum up uh, what, what I'm suggesting here, according to this reading, based on this evidence, First of all, the olive, the fruit of the tree which is symbolized by olives, from which anointing oil is obtained and from which the bread of life is made. So that would be the tree of life is quite literally, uh, in the sense of Genesis chapter 2 and 3, would be the olive tree. Because again, there's those four trees that are mentioned. And among those four trees, we have the fig tree, which matches up to the fig tree and judges the thorn bush, which matches up to the thorn bush and judges, and we have the olive tree, which matches up to the tree of life, and we have the grapevine, which matches up to the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So this olive tree is symbolizing the anointing and is the wisdom of God. So quite literally, the, uh, the wisdom that comes from God, and so it's symbolized by this olive tree, and that's why when uh, the anointed, uh, when someone is anointed with this oil, it is symbolic of gaining this wisdom that comes from God. And so the tree of deception is the deceptive form of wisdom, where it's as if, if you disobey God, you'll gain this wisdom that you don't already have. But really, the wisdom comes from trusting in God and obeying him. And so then the grape, the grapevine, would be the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So the forbidden fruit is symbolized by the flesh and blood of grapes from which wine is obtained. And the reason that the symbolism works, if you think of a wine press, so they, they put all the grapes in this vat, and obviously they're probably different processes now that are maybe more sanitary or whatever, but in, in Bible times, you would have people literally trampling on the grapes in order to get all the juice out, in order to make this wine from it. And so there'd be this large uh, flowing red liquid that's about as close as you can get to the, the color of blood, the sort of dark red color juice. And the person who's trampling them would have this blood of the grapes up to their knees, uh, staining them from their feet to their knees. And similarly, if you look at someone in a slaughterhouse, or in Bible times, it would be the priest at the temple where he's slaughtering all the animals and the blood is draining out and he's standing in the blood. So these pools of dark red color liquid, this blood from the animals, and it would be up to his knees that he would be covered in it. So the imagery would be very noticeable that somebody who's trampling the grapes in the wine press would look just like the person who is slaughtering the animals and shedding their blood in the slaughterhouse. And so the in the symbolic sense, it is the grape, but in the literal sense, it is the flesh and blood. The one thing that he strictly says in Genesis 9, 4, but you shall not eat the flesh and the blood, for the blood is the life. So we are not to eat that. And again, that's the one thing we weren't permitted to eat in the beginning in Genesis 1. We could eat of any actual fruit of the tree and any actual plants of the ground there's no actual fruit or vegetation that we're forbidden from eating, but it is this symbolism uh, symbolized by the grape that we are not to eat any flesh and blood. So it's literally the flesh and blood of our fellow creatures, the one thing God has consistently told us to abstain from shedding both before and after the flood. So hopefully today's talk uh, gives you at least some something to think about uh, I'm, again, this isn't the, the view that Creation Care Church is saying is absolutely the only correct view. 
This is my own personal view that I've come to through my own personal research. And I wanted to share it with everyone today because I thought it might resonate with a number of you. So I hope that today's talk was at least interesting to you, if not a uh, sort of eureka moment for you. Now, if you have any questions or comments, we'll get to that in this next part of the talk. See, first comment from vegan Brian, animal activist. Hi, everyone. Shalom and namaste with love from Kansas. Hi, Brian. Shalom to you. For those who don't know the Hebrew, that's peace. And namaste, that's what, that's what I usually say when someone invites me out on Friday night. I say, namaste home with my cat. And Rosalind. Welcome everyone, greetings from Leeds, UK. Hi, Rosalind, glad you could join us. Jonathan, blessings from upstate New York. Thanks, Pastor Craig, for the awesome Christspiracy review. Looking forward to the sermon. Awesome, good to have you, Jonathan. I'm glad you liked our review. If anyone wants to, to watch it, it's on our Facebook page and our YouTube channel and video form, or you can go to creationcarechurch.org, and that's where you can find the written version. Anamik, a very interesting topic. Hello, Anamik. Hopefully after hearing it, you still find it interesting. Good to have you. Fred, hello from California. Hi, Fred. Glad to have you. Good to see you. We're now streaming on YouTube, live streaming on YouTube in addition to Facebook. So if that's a preferred platform for you, you could find us there as well. Let's see, hello from the Netherlands. Hello, Anamik. Kathy, welcome from Minnesota. Hi, Kathy, glad you could be here. Live Mercifully, joining from YouTube. Hi, everyone watching from California. Hi, Live Mercifully, glad you're here. Tim, hello from Kathy and Tim in Ohio. Hello, Kathy and Tim, glad you could join us. Kathy, nice to see you, nice to see you too. Glade, hi from Northern Ireland. Hello, Glade, glad you're here. Renee, hello from New Jersey. Hello, Renee. Charlotte, needing prayer due to very bad health news yesterday. It's going to be a rough time from Central Florida. Uh, we'll pray for you in the prayer meeting uh, this weekend, Charlotte. Let's see prayers from, for Charlotte. Patricia, watching from Alabama. Hello, Patricia. Let's see. Uh, I am a horse nut. Hi, everyone. Be blessed. Hello, I am a horse nut. Glad you could join us from YouTube. Thanks, Pastor Craig. You're welcome. Kathy, uh, also praying. And again, if you'd like us to pray for you, you could email prayer at creationcarechurch.org and we'll pray for you this weekend. Anne, hi from Ottawa. Hello, Anne. Heidi from Tennessee. Hello. Christina from New Jersey. Hello, Christina. Uh, I hope you and yours are all fine after this morning's earthquake. Uh, I am fine. I'm not sure where the earthquake is. I know there's one in Taiwan that was pretty big. Um, prayers for them. Sue, hi from New Zealand. Hi, Sue. Sharon, greetings from Massachusetts. Hi, Sharon. Cindy from Texas. Hi, Cindy. Let's see. Lisa from Texas. Hi, Lisa. Texas representing today. Luke, hello everyone. Hi, Luke. Laura, hello from South Carolina. Hi, Laura. Let's see, Luke, Eve added her own legislation. God didn't tell them they can't touch the fruit. He only said they cannot eat from it. Yeah, so that's where the, the text is a bit ambiguous. You're right, it doesn't specifically say that. And so either Eve made it up or God said it to them and it's just not recorded in the scripture. So one of those two things would be the case. Let's see, Chris, hi from South Carolina. Hi, Chris. Gene, I send a prayer request in your inbox. Thank you. All right, Gene, we'll check that out. Thank you for sending that request. 
Good to have you. Let's see, Jonathan, brilliant conclusion, worthy of more study and meditation. Awesome. Glad that you uh, you found this today's study helpful. I think one thing, if uh, if somebody, let's say, disagrees with the conclusion that I'm suggesting here, well, that's fine. But now I've presented my biblical case uh, for what I believe the tree of knowledge of good and evil is and what the tree of life is. And if you have an alternative view, then, well, let's see your uh, evidence. I'm not saying Jonathan, your evidence, but like someone else who might disagree with this particular conclusion. And so there's quite a few instances that I've brought up, like with the Nazarite vow and the four trees mentioned in Judges and how those match up with the four trees mentioned in Genesis 3 and how there's this uh, this link between all of these things where it's this thoroughgoing thread where from beginning to end, God is not wanting us to consume flesh and blood, he wants us to be living according to this wisdom of God, these ways of peace, all her ways are ways of peace. And so if someone says, well, I reject that conclusion, I think the tree of knowledge of good and evil, this fruit is this other thing. I think it's an apple. Well, where are apples even mentioned in the Bible? Or I think it's a pomegranate, or I think it's a fig, or I think it's something else. It's like, okay, well, show me your biblical evidence for this, and then we'll compare them side by side. So today's talk was more just sort of showing here's my evidence, and if you have a different perspective, present yours. Let's see, Julie, what about literal wine? I don't drink it myself, but know other Christians that do. What do you think of that? Well, it's a good question. And I think a lot of, uh, there's a lot of different views uh, within Christianity about uh, alcohol. Uh, I know that for myself, uh, I abstain from all forms of alcohol. And so I think that when it comes to drunkenness, the Bible is pretty clear that we should not be drunkards. In fact, there's a passage that says, do not even mix with the drunkards or the gluttonous eaters of flesh. And so those two things are, are often put together in the same category. So if you're somebody who wants to sort of stay away from it even further, where it's like, well, some people, they might say, well, I can drink a little bit of alcohol and I just won't ever get drunk. And so I'm, I'm avoiding that thing that the Bible says to avoid. I'm avoiding drunkenness. And it's like, okay, I, I guess you're avoiding the thing that the Bible's specifically saying to stay away from. But then I find that for a lot of people, when they start drinking, the first thing that happens is their judgment starts to get impaired. And then once their judgment starts to get impaired, the first bad decision they make is to keep drinking beyond that first or second drink. And so then they end up drunk and making really bad decisions and uh, potentially hurting themselves and others. Uh, and so I think it's it's a wise thing to do to stay away from it altogether. Um, but again, if somebody maybe shares has a different perspective uh, where they think drinking some amount is okay, well, there's biblical evidence to suggest that that might be the case as well. So I think that would sort of be a, a personal conviction on, on your part which is something that I certainly think is a, a great idea uh, to do that. But as far as um, the Bible specifically saying, don't drink any amount of wine at all, um, well, it's hard to even define what is wine because a lot of times in the Bible, the word grape juice and wine are used with the same word where it'll say like new wine and old wine. So like the old wine would be like the aged wine, which would be actual alcoholic wine, like fermented wine. But then the new wine might be this grape juice that's like freshly pressed. And so the fruit of the vine is, is not even easy to know like which passages are referring to which a lot of times in the Bible. So it's hard to make some sort of overarching universal claim. But I, I think in general, uh, if you want to pick one or the other, it's better to abstain completely rather than risking uh, exceeding it. Let's see, Mr. B. Kings, that was excellent. Well, thanks. Your, your name is also excellent, Mr. B. Kings, and I'm glad that you can join us from YouTube. I'm glad that you found tonight's study 
helpful. Let's see, live mercifully, ha ha ha, namaste home. <laughs> Glad that you like my joke, live mercifully. Let's see, Sue, I had to go to the shops for something, so we'll listen to the other half later. Sounds interesting. Great to meet up anyway. Well, I'm glad that you could be here, Sue. And if anyone does join late, you can always watch the rerun on our Facebook page or our YouTube channel, or you can go to our website, creationcarechurch.org. You won't be able to hear my, my jokes live though, so that's the drawback. Let's see, Victoria. Hello from Victoria in Oberlin, Ohio. Hello, Victoria. Glad to see you. And you give us a little peace dove. I assume that's a dove of peace. So welcome, Victoria, and peace to you as well. Claudine, hi, everyone from Santa Ana, California. Hi, Claudine. Welcome. Let's see, Luke, I personally think Eve added her own legislation to not touching the fruit because the snake took it as an easy way to tempt Eve into eating. It's a mistake many believers do today where they add their own legislation, which makes them more prone to sin. Okay, that's uh, that's certainly, like I said, that's one valid conclusion to draw from that. But I wanna suggest maybe another perspective that maybe that's not really what was going on, even if maybe God didn't tell her that that extra instruction not to touch it. Uh, maybe she came to that decision on her own. So as we said, maybe if the Bible doesn't say abstain completely from all forms of alcohol, just don't get drunk, you might say, well, I don't even want to put myself in a position where I might, you know, accidentally get drunk. And so I want to just abstain completely. So you're doing something, you're adding your own legislation, but you're not doing it because you're trying to put something equal to God. You're trying to get yourself uh, one step removed from, from accidentally doing the thing that we're not supposed to do. So if we look at the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5, it's starting in verse 21, it says, You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. But I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother shall be in danger of the judgment. And whoever says to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whoever says, you fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. And so this idea here is Jesus is saying, well, yeah, it's a sin to murder. But he's saying, don't just avoid murder. Avoid getting angry with someone to the point where you're tempted to commit murder. Because if you get if you allow yourself to get angry with someone to the point where you want to murder them, then you're only one step removed from actually murdering them, which is the sin. So he's saying, don't even put yourself in a position where you'll be one step away from committing the sin. Like stop it further back. Whenever you start getting angry with your brother to the point where it could escalate to the point where you'll want to kill him and then actually kill him, way back there stop it and put it in check so that you never get to that point where you're one step away from committing the murder. And so that might've been what Eve was doing where she's saying, look, there's one tree that God said not to eat from. And so I'm not going to sit there and like look at this tree and touch its fruit and sniff it and kind of be like, Hmm, maybe I should, maybe I should do this uh, and sort of entertain those, those thoughts and those desires. Maybe she's like, don't even touch it. Don't even go near it. Don't even entertain the thought of disobeying God and his instruction. And so it might have been the sort of safeguard in that respect. So I think whenever somebody does something like that, uh, that's something that we get from, as I showed the Sermon on the Mount, that Jesus gives us a precedent and he does the same thing when it comes to adultery. It's like, don't even lust after somebody that would tempt you to then be in a position where you're prone to commit the adultery act and things of that nature. So again, Luke, not saying that your view is wrong. You uh, certainly could be correct on this. I just want to show that there's evidence for the other perspective as well. See, Julie, and what about eating grapes? 
I eat grapes fairly frequently. Okay, so if you are in an outward literal sense taking a Nazarite vow, then you would not want to break that vow by eating grapes. But if you're not taking the symbolic sort of outward literal vow, or you're not cutting your hair or eating grapes, then I would say that the more important thing is to understand what that thing is symbolically representing, and that is representing not eating the flesh and blood of creatures. So if you are vegan, you are not eating the flesh and blood of other creatures, then you are abstaining from the thing that that not eating grapes was symbolically intended to teach us. So I would say that uh, eating the grapes is more just like a symbolic thing. If you want to avoid it, avoid it. If not, I don't think that was the main thing. And so as long as you're vegan, I think you're doing the thing that it's it's trying to teach us. Let's see, Bayata, glad you could join us. With all the imagery and metaphor in the Bible, can we also presume that the tempting serpent was not really a snake, but someone or something? Well, it's a very good question, and I think that you absolutely can do that. And you don't even have to go outside the Bible to draw that conclusion. In fact, twice in the book of Revelation, uh, that is exactly what we see happen. I'm trying to find it. I was ambitious and I was like, I was, I'll find it right away. But it's there, it comes up two places in Revelation where it says the, the serpent of old is this dragon, which is Satan. So it does specifically say in the book of Revelation that that serpent was, in fact, Satan. So uh, it, it, I think it, it would have actually been a serpent, too, in the sense that he says, on your belly you will go and eat dust all the days of your life. But it was a serpent that was basically Satan in the form of a serpent. So he's saying you're more cunning than all the beasts of the field. So why would he be comparing the snake to other animals if it wasn't an actual snake? But this wasn't just some like random animal. This was Satan in the form of this animal. That's my understanding. Nicola, glad to have you. Great study. Can you recall what passage talks about not mixing with eaters of flesh? Do you suppose this means not even sitting at the same table as those eating meat? I believe Peter abstained from doing so in the Clementine homilies. Okay, excellent question. And the passage is in, I believe it's in Proverbs. Doesn't look like anyone else has found it already. So Proverbs. I have like a whole bunch of Proverbs that are <laughs> circled. So I have to look it up. It's uh, I, I can quote the passage to you, though. I'm not sure where it is in Proverbs, though. It says the, let's see, do not mix with wine bibbers or gluttonous eaters of flesh. And some translations say gluttonous eaters of, of meat. And then people think, oh, well, that's just gluttonous eaters of food. But the word there is baser, which is flesh. And it always means flesh. And so we know that that is uh, eaters of flesh. So don't mix with those who do those things. And Paul uh, it makes a similar comparison, uh, again, depending on your translation of Paul, where he lumps these two things together, where he says that eating the flesh and drinking alcohol are things that make someone prone to violence. And so that's why we they're morally questionable. Um, so that would be further evidence to support this. And then your question about sitting at the same table well, Paul also talks about that in, I believe it's 1 Corinthians, maybe chapter 11, where he talks about not eating at the table of demons. You can't sit at the table of the demons and also the table of the Lord. Maybe 
anyway, we, we included it in a live talk a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and if you like Google search any of these things, it, it should come up right away what the scripture verse is. Uh, but yeah, I think this was a big thing. And like you said, in the Clementine homilies, it mentions the this table of demons dozens of times. And on my Swords to Plowshares YouTube channel, I, I sit down with uh, my friend Chris and uh, we look at some of these passages. So if you'd like to learn more about the table of demons, you could do so at that YouTube channel. And yeah, I think that there, there's definitely some merit to doing this, to taking this stand, and there is evidence. It seems like that was a, a thing that Paul and Peter were having some, some squabble about, and it's unclear exactly what that was because we, we don't get both sides of it. Uh, but we hear Paul talk about that when he says, I confronted Kephas to his face about not eating with the, the Gentiles or something like that. And so, yeah, this was a, clearly a big issue in the early church. The Jerusalem Council in Acts 15 uh, was ruling on this issue. And so, and there's also this thing that we talked about when we talked about fasting in a live talk a few months ago, where some people, they'll, they'll wear a fork that they'll wrap around their wrist. And that represents the taking a pledge that they won't sit at the same table of people who are eating products of violence. And so uh, if that's something that you choose to do, uh, I definitely think that there is biblical support and non-biblical support, or not non-biblical, but extra biblical support for that. that. That was something the early church was doing. Um, I'm still researching that myself, so uh, I can't say definitively that, that yes, that's something that all Christians should be doing. But uh, if that's something that you're feeling called to do, I think that's a great idea. So live mercifully, slightly off topic, but was the film Christspiracy saying that Jesus was a Nazarite as opposed to someone from Nazareth? If that's the claim, I have a question, character limit here on YouTube. Um, I don't think that was the claim. They were saying he was a Nazarene, which I think in their mind is slightly, is not necessarily the same thing. So the Nazarenes are mentioned in a lot of the heresiologi heresiologists books like uh, the Irenaeus and Epiphanius and, and uh, some others. And so the Nazarenes might be not the same thing as Nazarites, but in the Old Testament, they're the Nazarites, uh, which signify those who are taking this Nazarite vow. And there is some evidence in scripture that both Jesus and John the Baptist were Nazarites. So in, I believe it's Luke... See, where is it? In Luke chapter one, Luke 115, it talks about John the Baptist being a Nazarite. And then Matthew 223, it mentions that Jesus is a Nazarite, and that's the fulfillment of that verse, which is in Judges, uh, Judges 13, verse 5, that that would apply to Jesus. I think John 145 also suggests this. And so uh, there's some evidence for that. And if that's the case, then uh, when he's dying on the cross, that would give some significance to them putting that wine up to his mouth to drink as it's finished. Because when you complete your Nazarite vow, you're supposed to offer an unblemished lamb. And so he would be, that was the last thing he did before giving up his own spirit. So if he's that once for all sacrifice, that unblemished lamb, it would make sense that that's the completion of his Nazarite vow as well. Uh, but I think that's not the claim that they're making necessarily. Let's see, Stephanie, hello from Ontario. Hello, Stephanie. And Amik, it was uh, Yahusha's first miracle he did, changing water into wine at the wedding. Yep, so that's the miracle at Cana in the Gospel of John, where he turns the, the water into wine. And that's the point where it says all the disciples began to believe. And then Sue, I'm probably way off beam here, but the hair idea reminds me of Bob Marley. Was he a Nazarite? I wouldn't have a clue. Uh, I'm also not sure if he took a Nazarite vow, but yes, the, the sort of long flowing dreadlocks would be exactly the kind of thing that you would see with a Nazarite. 
So yeah, Anamik, very interesting topic. Definitely something to listen at again, research and pray about. I had something completely different as the forbidden fruit in my mind. Yeah, most people, they uh, this is not a view that they've heard before. It looks like we have a few more comments that unfortunately we're out of time, so won't be able to get to. Uh, I'll have to respond in the comments. So thank you everyone for these comments and your participation. Hopefully this was an enlightening talk. And next week we're doing Moving Mountains based on Mark 11, verse 23 to 26. So what does it mean to move mountains? And now let's close in prayer and then we'll have our fellowship. Our Father in heaven, thank you for all the people that you've brought here today for tonight's live talk. And we pray that this would encourage people to dive deeper into the mysteries of your scriptures and to have a deeper uh, connection with things and to live according to your very good will. And whatever this uh, forbidden food might have been, uh, let us live according to your very good design in the beginning, where there's no creatures that are harmed. We're all living according to your wisdom, which you say is the tree of life, this wisdom where all your paths are paths of peace. And there's no violence and no bloodshed. So let us not trample our fellow creatures and uh, shed their blood, but instead let us be friends to them and let us be in this fellowship, covenant relationship with them and with you, Lord. And let, let your spirit guide us in all things. We pray this all in your son Jesus' name, Yeshua HaMashiach, the anointed of the tree of life. Uh, Emmanuel, God with us, amen. So thank you again for joining us and we look forward to having you again next week. God bless.